way to Jethro's place. He didn't want to go nowhere. He was satisfied with being right there. A stronghold had made him flee from everything that he had been taught, all of his people, and live in a foreign land until God shows up and tells him, I have purpose for you. Strongholds have a way of making us set somewhere what God had plotted for us. Strongholds have a way of making us not forget or not let go of things that have attached itself that we really have authority over to let go of. Amen? Strongholds. Strongholds really stay in there when we look at it from a world's point of view. World's point of view. When the world's view of, 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 of the things and the issues in our life become our issue, how did that happen? When we give more, when we give more favor to the news, give more favor to programs, television, movies, phone calls, when we give more favor to people and other people's conversation, strongholds become more of a worldview because I don't see it from my perspective. Now I tie in everybody that I'm a part of in my conversation. You know, you can. You can get into somebody without physically being involved in them. Your mindset becomes so deep entwined with them that they become a part of you and you become a part of them. And it never alters. You, your conversation becomes just like theirs. A world's view, not solely focused on what God has for us, but what the world and its point of view has given to us about our circumstances. We have to be mindful of that. Materialism, things, yep. possessions can become strongholds. I got to have it. I mess with my sister law. She here. I'm thankful that she's here. But I have to point out, she walked through that mall. She's great. She's great till, she, till her eyes see anything in that woman. <laughs> Amen. It's not just little stuff, it's whatever. She loves. She loves, but it's not shopping, but she loves seeing. She loves seeing beautiful, beautiful things, ornaments and clothes, and she just loves it. And she see herself in it. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem. It's not my issue. But I love her. But it's when she see herself in it that it just, it, it just, I say, oh, Lord, here it go. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. We, I'm glad she here so I can say it in front of her <laughs> But I'm telling you, and she know it. She'll say it in a minute. I need you to stop shopping. That means you got to stay in the house all day. <laughs> she still going to shop. But there's phone. There's phone. There's phone. There's phone. There's phone. There's phone. There's so, so think about it. Okay. So, what are we saying? Yeah. So, I'm not going to give Satan the authority or the glory, but there's a system in place that are many things convenient for us. And sometimes we have to catch ourselves to make sure it ain't too convenient. Sometimes we have to draw the line. Yep. And say enough is enough. And that material thing is not just, see, it went from spiritual, which is the opinions and the attitudes and the mindsets of everybody else, to the physical possessions. Satan has tried to work from every dynamic of your life, every angle, every aspect. Satan has set up a system to try to come at you from all turns. Now, God wants you to have the world. God wants you to have everything you'd have a desire for, as long as you have a desire for him first. If we have a desire for him first, then that kind of coins us from going too far to the right or too far to the left. If we keep our desire in him centered. But it's not fun like that. Tell the truth. It's not fun keeping God at the center. Ain't that right? Because my money at the center. My car at the center. My house at the center. If I move that stuff out of the way, then I'm just going to be bored sitting there like God at the center. But that's not really true. But that's how Satan has taught us. 
It's not fun being a true 100% filled Christian or believer. 100% obedient to the laws and, and, the, and the practice of righteousness in God. It's pouring. If your mindset enjoys the world, yes it is. But when we get caught up in what God has available for us and start identifying with the things that he makes available for us, that's even some things that's in the world that we can tiptoe around and he still give us the pleasures of our desire. And we still stay within his dynamic. He told us lust is, is, is out of water. How many of us experience lust? Come on, hold up. Put your hand up good. Now look around, church. See, sometimes we think we don't want to deal with that. We're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. All of us experience some of those. Because we in the flesh still. Because we are. We in the flesh. We in the flesh. Go ahead. You're going to feel what's in the flesh. Before I go to scripture, let me go to actuality. When you get in your car and you drive down the street, you come to a red light. If you stop at the red light when it's at red, it's less likely you'll have an accident, but it don't guarantee you. But if you continue to blow through every red light that you come to, what's going to happen? More likely it's going to happen. What was the purpose of God giving the law to man at the time Moses came? Because by nature, by action, he was totally out of order. Anything went. So the law was given that we would physically line ourselves up with what's the right way to live and keep keep incidents and accidents and diseases and all of those things from coming upon us. More likely than not. So in practicing the law, it, it helps us to avoid some of the things that attach itself to our bodies because we we adventure in, in everything. You know, and, and God said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And he did fulfill it. But in his fulfilling, he don't hold us obligated spiritually. Remember, he came as the spirit of the word to represent our understanding of how all of this stuff applies. And I think that's where we get caught because we think that he came and destroyed the physical application of the law. He did. He came and took us to a spiritual level of the law. Remember he said in the word, if you just think it, you have sinned. The reason why he was saying that because in the Jewish culture, if you didn't sin against a Jew, it wasn't a sin. If you committed a wrongful act against, against somebody that wasn't a Jew, you wasn't violating the law. You was in order with the law. So what he's trying to tell them, if you think it and do it to somebody else, you have did it unto me. He was taking them to a higher level of understanding of the law. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to go to a higher level of understanding of physical in order to receive spiritual. See, spiritual don't really open itself up until we identify with the fullness of what this law meant. Give you, give you a point. The law of attraction. They talk about it all the time, the law of attraction. If you think it, you can draw it to you. Because the more you think it, the more it attracts to you. The law of attraction. And it manifests. The more you put your heart to something, the more you put your thoughts to something, the more you begin to move in ways to bring it into existence. Right? In the power of the tongue. So it kind of works together. It's in tandem with it. The one exception. You only give them power through the authorization of God. But if you leave God out, then you don't have the power. So you can speak all day. And if you're not, if you're not, you ain't connected, so you bring the wrong law. You begin to attract to the wrong concept of the law. 
because you left God out, right? But your negativity still brought it into existence. Yes. And what Jesus is trying to say to us, be mindful that I am not of negativity. I am of goodness and mercy, love, kindness. And the more you gravitate to me, the more you see that the law wasn't made to rule over you, you were made to rule over the law. Why? Because of how you fulfill your spiritual walk. Mm. Go ahead, sister. And also, the scripture says, where there is no law, there is no order. Right. Man has to have his law. But yeah, I'm not saying to, that we don't need law to fulfill. Mm -hmm. But we're not bound. We're, we're not bound. The law doesn't rule over the spirit. Right. I think sometimes we get lost because some people think the law rule over the spirit. No, the spirit rule over the law. But until you connect to the spirit in oneness, the law still has authority over you because you're not in full application of the spirit. Go ahead. And that's absolutely true because the Holy Spirit is your guide. Right. Right. And so the Holy Spirit was in your heart. If it ain't in your heart, guess what? You ain't going to break the law. So all those commandments, those things, that's not here, that's not all those right. things are not going to be within you. When you become your heart is, Yeah, because the Holy Ghost is in there and you have been renewed and you've been changed. So if it was not so, you are bound not only to commit the law by virtue of thinking it, but also in practicality. And look at, look at Paul when he talked about the third heaven. It was a place Paul went through in his vision and his dream with God. And when he went there, God told him, don't tell nobody. Right? Why? Because everybody's not ready to receive him. Everybody's not ready to receive, and they will look at you as if you're crazy. Because you done spoke about something that they don't even, they don't even see the first level of what heaven is all about. I mean, you're talking about three levels. <laughs> you understand? So when Jesus came and started beginning to teach the the Jews and the Pharisees and Sadducees about the Spirit of God in flesh, which he represented, that came out of his words that manifest in his actions. You hear me? They looked at him and said, this man crazy. He talking about God in him. He God. When in all actuality, what he was saying is my spirit is to do the will of my Father. I have surrendered myself to do my Father's will. Period. So everything behind me is in obedience to the will of the Father. That means my yesterday, my today, and my tomorrow to be the will of the Father. It has nothing to do. So how do we how do we bring them to a level of understanding that this thing has to be deeper? It has to be deeper in your thoughts about manifestation of the law. You have to see the law deeper than the physical application of it in order to receive a heavenly understanding of how the law truly applies in your life. You know, it, it's, we could go to scripture one by one by one, but I say to you, if you dig in there deep enough, you'll see it. Because if I talk to you all day about it, you won't see it because I saw it. But until you're ready to receive it your way, See, God has a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And I can share it with you. Think about it. As long as you've been going to church and you are part or was a part of a great teaching, hey, are we? I know he done dug into those subjects, right? And I done been in the car, I done sit there and listen to him teaching. I have tapes of him sitting there, sitting there teaching. And I know he done dug into it, the church you come from. I know the preachers have dug into it, but we still didn't get it. Why? Because God said, you can't get it to me and you. We got to get on one accord. You got to start looking at me and not that preacher. So no matter what he says and how he says it, you will hear it, and it will start tingling in your ears. But until you start saying, Lord, reveal to me. Your word that it may be food to my system, yeah, pleasantry to my eyes. Yeah, don't separate the message from the message. 
you, you do. And not to say that's who you're worshiping. No, no, what God's saying is, I want you. You know how the old saying, old saying you say, Uncle Sam wants you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and then they had the old man with the, the flag on, mm -hmm. and he was pointing that finger. Every time you passed by that sign, you knew it got to a point where they didn't even have to put the writing up there. When you saw that man with that hat, you knew, you knew exactly what he said. When do we get to that point with God? He's not necessarily pointing his finger, but it's a finger pointing at you. It's a knock coming at you. It's a reminder of a word being said to you that's saying, uh uh, hold it. And express it when I'm getting ready to deviate. He showed himself and said, Do. I've been talking to you. And they're right. This God is so awesome. But all of that is for us to take charge of strongholds. You have authority. You have the power. But you got to have a yearning. you have got to have a yearning for him greater than your worldview or your materialistic desire. Your yearning for him has to be much more major, much more fascinating. And our pleasures will come because guess what? Our delight will be in, will become more in being obedient to Him, and we will find pleasure walking in obedience. Not necessarily seeing other people at their fall, but seeing how we can be a help to them yeah. by being who we are. That's the fullness of it. When God says, "I want to use you as my glory," Jesus said, that "You are the light of the world." Who likes a light and hide it up on their chair? You know, who likes a light? Just like the lights, and here's some. Oh, God, yes. thank you, Lord. Here we are in the church. The lights are on in here, but out there they can't see them. So when we leave this place, there has to be a transforming or a transfer of light to where I ain't talking about the daylight. But I'm talking about the light of understanding that we gained in here has to go with us out there. In our thoughts, in our understanding, how we see things, how we speak, you know? And we can pray, we can play games all day. But who we really playing on? We're really playing on ourselves. We're not playing on God. But God has made a way for everything that we need to do. But we just keep leaning on our own understanding because we don't really want to go to the level where we want to go, but we don't really desire to go to the level that God wants us to go to. We want to be 100% in God. We have a great, I'll just hold, you just hold that to tomorrow. You don't preach tomorrow. So you just hold that thought. We're going to finish this right here, just recapping on what. We started on last week, which we started on last week. Amen? Amen? This word is so rich, but our challenges is right here. It ain't gonna change. No matter how many different names I give it, it's still the worldview and the materialistic view of life. The greater part of it is how do we represent it and how it represents us. What do we earn? What do we draw to? How do we pull to it? And how does it pull to us? And then I've been, I've been on a quest as I say, okay, God, show me more. And every time he showed me more, it means that he expects more from me. It's so frightening that sometimes we refuse to open up the book because we get tired of being challenged as to what you're going to give me. <laughs> I'm showing you now what you're going to give me. You know? This faith in operation is not something that sits still. It's something that has to be manifest. You have to put it to action. In relationships, on jobs, in, in our living, in our families, it has to be put to action. To where you call people out based on your faith. Not necessarily trying to make them something other than what they are. But make them realize who they are. Amen? Worldview, materialistic view on our desire. 
That's really the challenge on our design. On our design. That's the food of it. Amen? That's the food of it. Personal attitude. Personal and attitude. When you allow yourself to get caught up in wondering. You know they said the people that attacked the children of Israel were nomads. You know what a nomad is? It's a wanderer. It's a wanderer. When you're wondering, it's like an opportunist, a, a criminal opportunist. Mm -hmm. Some people are opportunists. They wander around all day, and when they see something exposed, they grab it. Mm -hmm. Because you left it unsecured. You leave a purse in a car, an opportunity to a wanderer or a nomad. He don't have a place. He don't have a home. He don't, he don't have a, a shelter, or he don't have a, a seating. You see that in your purse the first time, he ain't going to stop because you got to check and see if anybody watching. Uh, once he see that you don't have no protection, that's really what he's looking for. Once he see that you don't have no protection, see the children of Israel were just wondering. They was headed to them to a dead land. Why? Because the Red Sea was right there. Where they going to go? They already know they're leaving Egypt and Pharaoh running after them. And they headed toward the Red Sea. And they said, well, they ain't got no more death in front of them and death behind them. We might well get the stuff that they can't take, take with them. An opportunist. A wonder, A no man. An opportunist. But they didn't realize when they struck out against the children of Israel that God had set free, they was going against the will of God. Sometimes we get too caught up in what our enemies gonna do instead of what God has already done. Enemy is not on the same No. He's never stopped the thing. Because we're about to do it wrong. It's just that oh, I see something. He just see an opportunity, but he don't realize, and sometimes we don't realize how powerful how powerful we are based on what we say out of our mouth that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I'm victim to it a lot of times. I give more strength to my enemy than I do to the God that I surrender to. And that's out of order. It's out of order. So I can work on increasing my what? My faith. How do I increase my faith? Put it to work. Put it to work. Faith without works is dead. So you, you, yeah. So you, you have to put the word of God reveals to you in His word. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you just lay down all day, your work is not being manifested, and your faith is not being shown in your work. You just chill all day, every day, doing nothing. And that's the reward you get. I tell you something that jumped out at me. I was reading. And one of the things that the reader said, the writer would say, is that when you lay around all day, one of the benefits of exercise is that some of the things that attach itself to you from sickness, from being just doxal and not really doing anything, and the sickness and the, and the, and the health diseases that are, uh, attract itself to you, Exercise help ward off some of those things. Because sickness don't like health. <laughs> health come from exercise. In some conditions. I said, whoa, are you really trying to make me feel bad? Or are you trying to help me? Because <laughs> I started enjoying watching TV. And then one of, one of the key things he said is, when you're watching Netflix, Netflix, oh Lord, that's a sister. When you're watching Netflix, guess what? Netflix not going to make you healthy. Netflix, if you put two, won't happen, won't happen. Let me help y'all. She said, if I put it on the health channel, won't happen. 
But I will. I will put it on the health chart and watch them exercise. Mm -hmm. And I'll be saying, see, you can do that. You need to get up and do that. You can do it. No, no, if I put it on the health chart, you can do that right now. Just get it out. Just get it out. And last night, I did it. I got out on the floor. And when I got out on the floor, I started my stretching, went down to my knees, went down to my feet. You hear me? And I was like, wow, what a difference. What a difference. I can go down. I can go even further. I even began to touch the side and try to take my head down. And I said, wow, what a difference. It's a whole lot different than what I used to do. And then I thought about it. Yes, it's a whole lot different because you weren't doing nothing. You automatically change just by going down to the floor. And then one of the nemesis of why I hadn't did it jumped out at me because I called myself finish. I said, now how you going to get up? How you going to get up, man? And I worked my way, and I got up. And one of the things that jumps out at me is say, even when it's tough, do it. Because he'll figure out a way to help you get up by driving you to do what they say is impossible. Strongholds can be knocked out of the way, out of the place. If you Change your mind. Mm -hmm. Amen. I mean, Reverend, you can't, you have trouble getting up because you haven't worked your body and you're scared. You scared a bit. Well, yeah. it's bad. Yeah. How good did you feel when you were doing it? All right, right. as you work along, mm -hmm. it's going to be easier and easier to get up. Remember, we, that's what we talked about. We have to get hurt. That's right. Because we're hurt by our mind. Dormant state, your mind is still wrong. And it's constant receiving. It's receiving that information in your mind, and you feed it to your brain. And your brain is feeding it to your body. That's right. And no such thing as cutting it off. It does not cut off. Because you don't have the power. You don't have the power. You don't have the power to stop your thinking. You can ignore it. You can ignore it. But you don't have the power to stop it. Go to Deuteronomy 28 and 20. Mm -hmm. Who is it? Just stay right there. We're coming to it. She got kings. Okay. And I read it for me. The Lord shall send upon three curses. Uh, is it vexation? Vex? Vexation? Okay. Vexation. Rebuke. Rebuke. Okay. In all that thy sets. Thine hand upon for to to do upon thou be destroyed and upon thou perish quickly because of wicked or of thy doings. Mm, stop. Stop. He said he gonna say curses, but why? What was that you read at the end? Because of what? Your wickedness. Because of your wicked doing. Lord don't have curses for you unless you go out and do some wicked things. Why? Because your actions bring that down upon you. It's not God's desire for us to be caught up in evil things. That's why he separated Satan. And then gave us a warning. He didn't have to give us a warning. He gave us a warning that that spirit is coming down to you in that enemy. Watch it. We, we listen last week, he said, before the flood, after they was cast out of the garden, before the flood, when the, go to six, go to six. We read that, go to six. Look at uh, Genesis six. Hold that, hold that finger there, go to Genesis six. Uh, maybe I need to go there, because I got to uh, Hold yours, James, I, I probably can get there quickly. I said you can't move fast. <laughs> Sound like a dog. 
those spirits still was in existence. And that those spirits associated with the spirits, such as Jesus, when he said to the demon, who are you? And they said, legions. And he said, depart from him. And the legions said, don't care, don't just, don't kill us. Cast us into the swine. Because them spirits are roaming out in the world, even though he destroyed their bodies. Their spirits are still searching for somewhere to sit on. And we have to be watchful. Watch as well as pray. Why watch as well as pray? <laughs> Why watch as well as pray? Because you, in prayer, in prayer, you are in oneness with God. In watching, you are physically and spiritually surrendering your thoughts to God. So that's meditation. So I'm watching by meditating on the word and I'm praying in connection with God that in our oneness, God oversee me. Oversee my body. Oversee my mind. Amen. But you don't, here's what I tell people. You don't get to that until after you messed up. After you done went so far to where you realize, Lord, there's no way for me to get back except for you. I can't change without you. But I know I need to change. How many of us been in that situation where we just know we need to change? Yeah, yeah. I need to change, Lord. And God's saying to you, I'm able. Are you willing? I'm able. I was playing with the word this morning while I was sitting and eating. I was just listening to the, to the fool of the word. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve was approached by Satan, and Eve was talking to Satan. And immediately after they took and ate, they saw their nakedness. I got caught up right there. They saw their nakedness. Then they sold fig leaves to cover themselves. How many times have we tried to cover ourselves? Every time. Understanding so, so with their understanding. So, how many times we try to cover up our separation from God and act like we be connected and act like we don't want to go and still do the things that when we was there we used to do. You know, we take on this persona, this persona that says I'm I, I'm that perfect Christian, I'm that perfect walking God, and I got all this strength when we know we've failed. Mm -hmm. And we, we're playing games as if God don't see our games. And that's what he was saying. That, well, why are you hiding? Hiding is covering up. Why are you hiding? How are you going to cover up in a fleshly world to a God that's pure spirit? That's what we mess up at. Because we try to cover up with fleshly things a spiritual atmosphere. It won't happen. It can't happen. You can pretend all day, but it's showing up. It's showing up. It's showing up. You see, when you open up your eyes to the Spirit, you see it. But the first thing God tells you to do, and He told us to Adam now, stop looking at everybody else. Look at you. Adam was telling Eve, and Adam even gave Eve a name. But that wasn't the name God gave him. God gave him Adam. But Eve was named Eve because Adam separated from him. Because she gave him something that he, didn't, that he shouldn't have been. So he began to blame her. Instead of, we have become one, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Even in the middle of you giving me that, we still bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We still in this together. And we're going to fight this devil on one accord. Immediately, we begin to separate when we see the thoughts of somebody else. That's where the enemy jumps in like a flood. Because <laughs> he said, oh, I see you now. You don't have the strength or the commitment to stand in the gap. All they're saying is, say gave it to me. And you say, you gave it to me. Instead of, we in this together. I'm with you. I got your back. 
stronghold of fear of being identified by God that you was out of order. And being so more afraid of God looking at you instead of you saying, God, I was wrong. Because Satan made you believe that God going to punish you by destroying you when that's not the God that we serve. Satan wants you to destroy yourself. God came to give you life according to the word and give you life more abundantly. But Satan wants to cause you to destroy yourself by your fear of God. And that fear that God wants you to have is not to run from him, but to raise him up and by running to him. I'm lifting you up, God. I know what I messed up back there, but I'm running. Can't nobody help me but you. Can't nobody save me but you. Can't nobody free me but you. But watch this. And then you get yourself deep in. But watch this. Even in that concept, even in that concept, I'm led to believe that when that child first ran to you, when that, when that child first ran to you, you didn't punish him. You didn't listen to him. You heard what you wanted to hear. Because you was worried about your image and not theirs. Well, and once, and once, no, I'm talking about that first. I'm talking, no, I'm talking about that first time. Because after that first time, guess what that child does? He just got to behave. Instead of running to you, they run from you. One thing you say that shit, don't embarrass me. There you go. And, and the first thing they do is when they realize they made a mistake, they see their embarrassment of you. Now they're scared of punishment instead of taking, I need to go to the explain. And that's when they begin to develop that fear of punishment. Mm -hmm. Because instead of you being the person to lift them up and say, that's all right, we're going to be all right, you're more important to me than your mistake. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we were more caught up in our worldview and materialism where we planted or started the strongholds, not just in us, but we passed on our strongholds to them. Now, how do we go back and straighten that out?
that give you strength, but it will give you revelation. And not just revelation of how you messed up, but how he straightened it up. So that you can begin to walk in that straightening and lessen the messing. Because until then, guess what we're walking in? The messing up. And no matter how many times we say, I'm better, I'm better, no, I hear you. I hear you. But you're still walking in your mess. Right. Right. What you just said. <laughs> if you won't know how you how to straighten up, if there's no more telling, this is how you can make this better. Correct. One step at a time, one level at a time. I have to go back. Nicodemus said, do I go back into my mother's womb? He said, no. She just had to be born again. You got to pump. You got to surrender yourself to this man that it may also be in you. This man, what man? The man of Christ. And that starts with forgiveness. Are you crying out? I messed up. And you begin to cry out that all phases are messed up. Not just part of them. Because what we are, what our overall intent is, is to take that position out of control. Take that out of control. And when I start going back, all the way to where I stop being innocent, you know, in a relationship, <laughs> With a man and a woman. You know, it's never a time that you can't relate to when you first stop being innocent. It's like a clock. It can ring whenever you set the alarm. I need to remember that at 6 o'clock in the morning. 6 o'clock in the morning come, ding. Well, I remember when we were doing this in that why? Because it's the first time your innocent. Not just in your memory, man. Yes. yes. I'm not fighting with that. I mean, that's simple. That's simple knowledge. It's in your memory, man. But I ain't talking about your memory, man. I'm talking about when you first gave up your innocence. That's what I'm talking about. And when you go back to that day or that time and you realize how things change. How I went from thinking more God and thinking more desire. More flesh. The introduction was strong, You have to go back. So at each one of them stages, you have to go back to your moment of innocence and ask God to cover them. Because in the scriptures, we sold fig leaves, but God turned around and killed a young lamb and put the pieces together to truly cover us in the fifth book of Genesis. Because we couldn't cover ourselves with fig leaves, but the sacrifice of the lamb, which was a blood sacrifice, covered us. Amen? Come on, give God a hand. Right. Praise We, we do what God says. Mm -hmm. Amen. We do what God says. You know, I'm thankful. Uh, tomorrow at 1030, uh, Sunday service, we have a, our own evangelist. She'll be coming up, bringing the word. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we look forward to an awesome time with that. Let's come, let's come prepared with expectation to receive from God. Amen. Amen. But have your personal time in prayer. Sometime through now, from now to the end. Don't come in the church waiting on somebody to lift you up. No. Come and get prepared to receive the word of God. Come and get prepared to get on one accord with the spirit that's already in here. Amen. Amen. And the last part of that, we have a challenge as far as Bible study concerned. What we'd like to do, what we'd like to do is move Bible study because it's conflict 
to 15 minutes after church service. So we'll join it all together. So we we'll have 10:30 service, and at 12:30, by 12:30 we should be finished. 12:30 we're gonna be finished, and let's say at 12:45 we start our hour Bible study. What's on your mind, sir? Right. Some people be home. <laughs> some, some, some people be home. But, but I wouldn't have a problem going through service. Um, some, some people would be home. But, but, that's a thought. It's a thought. It's a thought. So y'all think on that, that's one of the options of maintaining, cutting it down to Zoom call or something like that. I, because it's becoming a conflict of time. And I will, I really like the direction that God is taking Avengers in. And um, I really want to keep going in the mountain because in the person, it's a whole lot better than on the mountain. Or here's another, here's another thing. Instead of having it at 12.30, have it at 2.30 on Sunday. You go home, take a break, you go, go no, get you no, something to no, eat, no, and come back. And I know that would that's why I can throw that out there in front of me. I mean, if you can end it service what, about twelve, twelve, then you can start the service twelve or one. If we could end it by twelve, you're exactly right. Boy, we would have to set the foundation. That, that's why I said twelve fifteen we would stop and twelve thirty we would start our battle study and be over that one time. I think that'd be good. Or here's another option on that. Or we can come at ten at nine o'clock and have nine o'clock. Yeah, have nine o'clock Bible study, and at ten o'clock is over with, and we go roll over into our ten thirty service. That means some people got to get up and stay up, and they can't go to bed and go to sleep. Right, right. So uh, think about that. We'll mention it tomorrow. That sounds good. Yeah. So we we'll start at nine o'clock. Most most churches have Bible school anyway. So we can so have. I, it's more applicable if you try to put it all in the same day. That yeah. sounds like a one. I would like that because of the confusion that's going on. So I would want us to. I want us to really continue the Bible study. So, so, so yeah. Remember uh, September. And, Christmas in September is coming up. Uh, that's the week of the 25th of 20, weekend it's of the 25th. The last, so it's the 26th of September. It's so the last one. 26th. So let's remember that, okay? Other than that, anybody else got anything else they want?